Coach K thinks Dan Hurley is perhaps the top leader in college basketball. I'm not so sure I agree. Yet. You are Locked On College Basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host today, Isaac Shade, and you're joining me at the place to get your college basketball content every single day, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making us your first listen or watch. I want to remind you that you can listen to every episode ad-free on Amazon Music. Special shout out to all you everydayers out there and all the members of the Locked On College Basketball Discord. So glad that you are all here with us. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Coming up on the show today, going to be a fun kind of conversation. Coach K thinks that perhaps UConn coach Danny Hurley is the top voice in the sport right now. We're going to talk about that and other options for that if he is not. We're going to look at a Texas A&M's non-con schedule, which just came out. Villanova has got some more help late, interestingly enough. And Kyle Guy is returning to Virginia. I'm all about that. So let's start with this Coach K and Dan Hurley conversation. Earlier this week, Coach K was on Rich Eisen's show and said this about Dan Hurley, quote, I think his commitment to the game was part of the reason he stayed, meaning not leaving UConn for LA. He's one of the leaders right now for college basketball, maybe the top leader, at least one of the top two or three. You have a responsibility. You know you can't just win trophies, although those, although those are nice to win. You have to make a commitment to the game. He's a lifer. His family are lifers. They have a huge commitment to basketball. I love them. I don't like them. I love them, end quote. So I want to hone in. We're going to unpack a little bit of all of that, but I want to hone in on this. He's one of the leaders right now for college basketball, maybe the top leader, at least one of the top two or three. So Coach K really said three different things there. I agree right now with one of them. He's one of the leaders right now for college basketball. I'm in on that. One of the. Maybe the top leader. I say no. At least one of the top two or three. I say no to that as well. Let me unpack why. Number one, I think that Dan Hurley is one of the top five, ten voices leaders in college basketball right now. I, though, am not ready to give him the top, not even top two or three. If we were saying influence or influential voice, yes, in that case, I would say that he is. But in terms of trust to be the voice of our whole sport, I'm not there yet. I I think right now, he doesn't have fully the balance that I'm looking for. He's got the willingness and ability to say things, to speak hard truths. Um, But there is a level of youthful brashness that I don't fully trust yet to be the voice for our sport. Um, You know, I I love it. And I think he's hilarious. I love that he's not afraid to make his opinion heard, and we absolutely need those voices at the top of the sport from guys that are winning championships, but not yet as the voice of the sport. If I'm thinking of more balanced voices, voices that don't mind saying things, but are just have more years of life under their belt that I think are better... um, and more seasoned advocates as the top voice or top two or three voices. I'm thinking somebody like Tom Izzo, like Bill Self. I think I'm even ready to put Mark Few in that category. If I, if you were giving me a top three right now, that would probably be my top. Um, I think with Mark Few, his Olympics role right now on that bench is helping a lot. I think it would help even more if he could just get it over the top and get that national championship that Tom Izzo and Bill Self both already have. I I just think there's something to that that gives people that level of respect. I trust them both more. Um, Matt Painter, I think, would be in that conversation for me. Rick Barnes isn't 
at, at Tennessee isn't as heavily a voice, um, but I think that the leadership side of it is there, right? He's got this like elder statesman role to him. I think, for example, Coach Cowell has those years of seasonability, you know, is much more seasoned. But I think he's a little bit too much of a wild card, loose cannon, all of, like a little more about himself than for the good of the sport. And I, like, I know that John Calipari, like I know that Dan Hurley loves this sport, loves this game, loves these young men. <laughs> But I just don't always, and this is a personal thing, but I just don't always trust that John Calipari, for example, has everyone's best interest at heart all the time. That's what I would want from the leader. And and I think that's all part of why I would love it if we had a college basketball czar, a college basketball commissioner, whatever it was, which is something, by the way, that Dan Hurley has advocated for. So I love that, you know, like there are things that I love. Um, And part of it is there is a big void that needs to be filled because of losing the guys that probably were the top three in Coach K, in Roy Williams, in Jay Wright. Those guys are all gone now. And so we're still kind of trying, we're in this couple year phase after that, where we're trying to figure out, okay, so who are the dudes now? And you don't just slot in and say, yeah, it's it's John Shire and it's Hubert Davis and it's Kyle Neptune. Maybe, but those guys need years and, and time to, to earn their chips in the game, right? And so you can't just turn it over to the new coach at those same schools. That's not how this works. Um, Jim Beheim, you know, it's another big voice that we've lost recently out of the actual game. But here's the second thing I would say about Dan Hurley. While I don't view him right now as the top leader, top voice, or top two or three voices, number two, I think he has a chance to become the voice. And I very well think he will get there. To me, that started with him not leaving for the Lakers. That is a stamping, I'm here, I'm doing it. And that's not to say he won't ever leave for the NBA because... I mean, it sounds like he wants to, right? Uh, from everything we hear, he but he loves college basketball. I think he's somebody who has college basketball's best interest at heart, who wants to have other coaches' best interests at heart, other programs and things like that. I mean, he's obviously going to fight for his team and his program, but but he wants to see college basketball thrive and do well. And yes, there is that youthful brashness and and youthful is a um, fluid thing here, you know, in terms of like uh, youthful in terms of head coaching years. Um, But look, coach K had some of that as well in his youth and, and grew and, and matured into who he was as a coach. And I see Dan Hurley being able to grow into that same thing. There's also that responsibility side of it that coach K talked about. And I believe that Coach Hurley embraces that responsibility that comes along with his role, with his status now as having just won back-to-back national championships. And that's the mantle that's placed on you when you achieve the things that he has achieved as one of the very few people on the planet to have ever done that, to, to win multiple national championships at the D1 level. And so as time wears on, and if Coach Hurley stays, heck, even if he leaves for a time and comes back, he can grow into this thing and become the voice of college basketball. So I'm not ready to go there with Coach K yet, but I certainly can see myself getting there um, in in the years to come. I'm curious your thoughts. Where, Where are you at on the voice of college basketball in terms of head coaches? And then I think it's important or appropriate at this point to say maybe who are some of those other voices, right? Like I mentioned the Matt Painter who, you know, as Purdue's star continues to grow, I think Matt Painter, because he has that respect from his peers and things like that. A name we haven't mentioned is Nate Oates, you know, as Alabama continues to to grow and flourish. I think he's going to have to get out of... Um, 
some of the sh- I feel like there's still a little bit of a shadow over Nate Oates right now for his handling of the Brandon Miller stuff a couple years ago. Um, but I think that that will fade and I think he will learn from that, you know, as as how he can become an even more capable coach himself. And so um, there are certainly others you would, you know, I, I think Shaka smart is somebody that if Marquette continues doing what they're doing and, you know, he's been at these various different, you know, from BCU to Texas to Marquette, he's somebody that's seen division one at multiple levels. Uh, You know, so there's, there's a lot there. Um, And I'm sure there are others we could come up with, but those are just a couple names that I think of as, as possible, the voice of the sport at some point down the road. Well, Texas A&M just released their non-conference schedule, and I tell you what, Buzz Williams is putting his team out there ahead of his SEC play, and it starts on day one. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Right after I tell you about game time, going to MLB games in the summer is one of my favorite all-time things to do. The game, the food, the people, everything that goes into making that experience just Uh, helps make all those special memories at the ballpark in the summer. And thankfully, when you're wanting to get tickets, you don't have to sweat last minute high price tickets because Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting those tickets even faster and easier. In fact, games uh, prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying those tickets. We're about to talk Texas A&M's non-conference schedule. Maybe you want to go see them play Purdue in the Indy Classic coming up on Saturday, December 14th. You can get tickets right now on the Game Time app. I saw them for as cheap as $149 there at Gainbridge Fieldhouse. Make sure you go check out the defending national runner-up against Texas A&M. Take that guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the app, create an account, and redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Texas A&M just released their non-conference schedule, so we're going to unpack it here, talk about it. For those of you watching on YouTube. Uh, you can see that I've pulled up the schedule and I apologize because the orange of Locked On College Basketball is clashing terribly with the maroon from the Aggies. But you know what? Gig them. Let's get right into this thing. 13 games on the schedule. Let me read it off for those of you who are listening and not watching. Uh, on Monday, November 4th, opening day, kicking off the season, Texas A&M at True Road Game UCF. And then that Friday, November 8th versus Texas A&M Commerce, November 11th versus Lamar, November 15th versus Ohio State, November 20th versus Southern, uh, November 26th, 27th, and 29th is the Players Era Festival in Las Vegas and with an off day there on Thanksgiving, December 3rd versus Wake Forest in the SEC ACC Challenge. December 8th versus Texas Tech. That'll be at Dickey's Arena in Fort Worth. That's part of the Coast to Coast Challenge. And then December 14th versus Purdue at the 2024 Indy Classic. We just talked about that during the game time read. And then wrapping up the non-conference schedule, two more games on December 20th hosting Houston Christian. And then on December 28th hosting Abilene Christian. So, I really like this schedule for Buzz Williams. Kudos to the AM staff and um, group for putting this whole thing together. As a reminder, SEC schools have 13 non-conference games as opposed to 11 for ACC, Big 12, and Big 10 because all three of those conferences have 20 conference games while SEC is still at 18 to get to that total of 31 regular season games. And so what I love about this is, how about this, straight from A&M's official release, quote, with the all-important net rankings in mind, the Texas A&M men's basketball team has constructed perhaps its toughest non-conference schedule in school history, end quote. Woo, that's saying something there for the Aggies. But as you look through this thing, and I I know it's um, a little easier to do than it is for ACC, Big 12, or Big 10, um, because you got 13 slots. But Texas A&M 
has has five games against power conference opponents, and that's not even including Players Era Festival. If you include that, um, it would get up to seven slash eight because one of them San Diego State, and we don't typically count them out in the West as that, but San Diego State. So we could call that eight in, if we're being honest. And look, it makes sense to challenge yourself in this way if you're Buzz Williams because the Aggies are returning a hefty amount of what they had led by Wade Taylor the fourth. And, you know, you bring in CJ Welcher from Nebraska. I mean, it just, A&M is going to be a very experienced team while a lot of other teams are trying to work all the new components in and figure out who they are. For example, by comparison, Northwestern also just released their non-conference schedule, 11 games. And it's not even close to like strength of schedule as you look at these two compared. I mean, I, I, Texas A&M's is right up there. So uh, let's talk about some of the parts of it. First off, we always bemoan the lack of high quality games on opening day in college basketball. We've got a couple little spots here and there of, of some tournaments, but what we Andy and I are always looking for and hoping and wishing for is that a power conference coaches would play each other on opening day so that we have something of a hurrah, let's get this going, but also that they would do it on, on true campus sites rather than neutral sites. And Oh, was I so happy to look at this Texas A&M non-conference schedule and see on game one, A&M at UCF, who, by the way, remember, is a Big 12 team now, to kick off the regular season. I have kicked and screamed and begged and pleaded, and this this is it. And I, look, I know Texas A&M and Central Florida isn't some like, wow, what a matchup, right? Like, we, we wouldn't, that doesn't jump off the page. But we have an SEC school at a Big 12 school on opening day. We will take it. It's a step in the right direction. Thank you to both of these schools. Now, what's great about it is not only is this happening, but it's part of a home and home that uh, AM will get a return game from UCF next year. I'm not gonna, I'm not sure because the, the language isn't very specific in the press release whether that will be on opening day as well or not, but Hey, we'll come to that bridge when we get there. Um, now, I've done quite a few of these non-conference uh, schedule breakdowns um, this offseason. And one of the things I've, I'm starting to see a pattern of is a lot of schools are scheduling these home and homes with other high major schools. And what's interesting is a lot of times they will do two um, sets of it that kind of offset each other. One on the road, like this one's going to be, and then the other one, which is, in this case, the Ohio State game. So the Ohio State game coming up, that is on November 15th, is at home. Last year, a and played up in Columbus, and this year the return game is at home. So here's what's happening, is you'll have two sets of these where it's kind of staggered, where one's at home, one's on the road, and then next year you'll probably have one on the road and one at home. So, for example, the away game at UCF is the front end of a home and home. This Ohio State little mini series is the back end of a home and home. So, I would imagine next year AM will schedule another high major opponent that will be on the road while the UCF game's at home, if that makes sense. And so, I, I'm seeing a lot more of this. It's a trend. Go, go check it out on other schools. Websites and you got to kind of Google to see like, hey, is this part of a home and home or is it a standalone neutral site? What are we doing? But what you're looking for is those true campus sites, true home and homes and against two different schools. So really interesting stuff there. Now, Players Era Festival, <clears throat> you know, there's been all the like, how are they going to do this? Will you play two teams and then crossbreed uh, with the other bracket? What's going to happen there? Well, now we know that there are two separate, this year at least, when we've got eight teams, two separate MTEs, and you just play with four teams in each, and you just play each team round-robin style once. So each MTE has a name. It's kind of like back when the Big Ten was the legends and the leaders. That was awful. Well, 
The players era MTEs are the Impact MTE, which is Alabama, Houston, Rutgers, and Notre Dame, and the Power MTE, which is Texas A&M, Creighton, Oregon, and San Diego State. So the Aggies will play Creighton, they'll play Oregon, and they'll play San Diego State. That's that's three nice games uh, to really test yourself and see where you're at there in uh, Las Vegas. So that'll be interesting. Two other things on this schedule. Number one is an interesting rarity. This is just, per, per Texas A&M's notes, this is just the third time ever with Ohio State coming, uh, third time that a Big Ten school has come to College Station to play. That's pretty interesting. And then also rarity, Wake Forest is just the second ACC school to come play in College Station in the regular season, at least. Clemson did it in back in like, 96 or something like that. Obviously, that's going to change now because of the ACC SEC challenge, where basically every other year an ACC school will be coming to College Station. So just keep that in mind. And then the Texas Tech game in the um, coast to coast challenge is what's uh, where that's taking place. That'll be at Dickey's Arena um, in Fort Worth. That's part of like three games that day. By the way, the pre sale for that starts next Wednesday. Tickets go on sale to the public next Friday if you're wanting to see AM against Texas Tech. On uh, the day of that game, which is December 8th, uh, Tech TCU versus Vandy will kick things off at 1130 Central, followed by AM Texas Tech at 2. And then <clears throat> that night, South Carolina's women, so reigning national champs, against TCU's women at 6 p.m. So be really interesting to go see that. It's funny, it's three um, in on the men's games, it's three Texas schools and Vandy. Let's go get another Texas school, right? Make that a thing. Anyway, there you go. Texas A&M, well done on your non-conference schedule. 13 games in totality. I'm going to say they drop. Three of those, give me the Aggies at 10 and three in the non-con schedule. Let me hear your predictions on it and we'll get to that. Now, coming up, Kyle Neptune got a little more help for Villanova. It's pretty late in the game though. Mm, what's up with that? And a hero is returning to Charlottesville. Excited for that. And we'll talk about all of it in just a sec. Villanova has done some work to help turn what seemed to be a very like off season into a well maybe kind of off season. Uh, one of my worries for Kyle Neptune though was that it's maybe too little, too late uh, for his tenure in uh, with with Villanova, and so gotta happen this year. So let, let's go back and remember this off season. So Eric Dixon's in the draft. That's not looking good. At some point, Max Shulga, who had committed to come from VCU, decides to go back. And you're like, oh, come on. This is terrible. So Shulga's still at VCU. But Eric Dixon pulls out of the draft. Wuga Poplar comes over from Miami. Enoch Boyaki comes um, from Fresno State after two years at Arizona State. And then now uh, we learn early this week that Chris Parker comes over from Alabama with a four with a full four years of eligibility. He was a freshman at Alabama last year, but redshirted, and so keeps his entire allotment there um, coming in to play at Nova. So he's a 6'9", 195-pound guard, basically, and that's his measurements per Alabama's roster last year, <clears throat> was a four star or high three, depending on which recruiting site you looked at in the class of 23, his highest ranking was 74th at ESPN. Chris Parker's was here's what's really interesting to me in this day and age. And these are the things you got to pay attention to. Now his final four schools, obviously Alabama, but also Missouri in central Florida. He's from Tallahassee. And finally Villanova. How interesting is that? In an interview he did, Chris Parker, after committing an uh, interview with VU Sports, he said, quote, I didn't visit again. Instead, the coaches and I got on the phone. When the coaches called me up back in high school, I was always very comfortable with them, so we got back in touch by Zoom. You are going to see more and more and more of this. When players decide to transfer, where's the first place you look? Let me go to somewhere else that I thought about going out of high school. 
because I trusted them as he, as Parker is saying about the Nova staff. Um, I thought they had something great to offer me. I was very close to going there, but ultimately didn't. And why I think this is such a critical reminder is a reminder to the student athlete, to the recruits and to the schools and coaches and players on those teams. Don't burn bridges, right? Like let's say you are a coach and you're at Villanova and Chris Parker chooses Alabama and Nate Oates over you. The worst thing you could do is pitch a hissy fit and throw stuff and get mad because then if and when Chris Parker enters the transfer portal, he's going to remember what how childlike you acted when you got didn't get your way in recruiting. And so there's no way he's going to consider you. But if you held, you know, composed yourself in a classy manner and said, hey, congrats, hope things work out really well for you in Tuscaloosa. Wish we could have gotten you, but man, I'm excited to maybe play against you sometime and see if we can beat you. You know, whatever it is. <clears throat> and then Chris Parker's like, man, Villanova, I already really liked them. They handled uh, me not coming there really well. Let me Let me check that out. You love to see it. Or if you're a student athlete, when you pick school A, don't burn the bridge with school B and be like, man, you guys, blah, blah, blah. Because you never know what's going to happen and come around. And maybe you want to go to that school and transfer there later. So just interesting how high school recruiting now can, like the first choice of the student athlete isn't the end of that journey. You want to hang on because you never know how it might come back around. Um, Ford Parker, his senior year of high school, 24.8 points a game, 14.2 boards, 7.1 assists, and 2.4 blocks. Now, this was in Class 2A in Florida, but he was the Class 2A player of the year. Those are ridiculous stats. Basically, averaged three assists shy of a triple-double. That's silly. I don't care what level you're playing at. And so his ability to do all these things at 6'9", I don't know if he's going to find his way into Villanova's starting lineup or at least right away. But that frame, that ability to defend on the wing like Chris Parker is able to do with a little bit of ability offensively at all three levels, that's a huge help for Kyle Neptune and hopefully can really get the ball rolling at Villanova here in year three for Coach Neptune. Man, because I just, I just want to see Nova doing well and being good. And so, I, and again, I think, Wooga Poplar and Eric Dixon are going to be the key linchpins to that happening. But an addition like Chris Parker is certainly, certainly helpful for the Wildcats. Great stuff there. Um, is, is Nova got enough now to be legit? I don't know yet. We're going to have to wait and see it on the floor. But they're in a better place today than they were three days ago. So that is good news. Last thing today, Kyle Guy is coming back to Virginia to be the athlete development mentor and special assistant. That's just a, in my opinion, that's just a nice way to say, Kyle Guy is going to come back and help our basketball players be dudes and understand the Tony Bennett system and, uh, you know, help perpetuate the University of Virginia culture and who we are and how we play basketball um, and how we comport ourselves on and off the court. Because Kyle Guy can do all of that. This was announced on Wednesday. It was most interesting to me because homie's hanging it up professionally at age, what, 26 after five years, uh, three in the NBA and then two overseas. And so I'm kind of bummed about that because I always just liked Kyle Guy's game. Uh, but I love that he's coming back to a place that he loves, that obviously loves him. By the way, Kyle Guy was fouled. Sorry to all you Auburn folks out there, but he was. It was a foul. Clear cut call it every time. Uh, Tony Bennett, here's the quote from Virginia's release. Quote, we are thrilled to welcome Kyle and his family back to Charlottesville. He is not only one of the best players I've ever coached, but also one of the finest young men I've ever met. He will make an immediate impact on our program, working with our players and sharing the expertise and competitive fire, yes, he's gained throughout his collegiate and professional career. Kyle Guy says, quote, Seville, I am back. I want to sincerely thank Coach Bennett and Carla Williams for trusting me with the opportunity to come back and begin this next chapter of my life. It was not an easy decision for me, but knowing how much love I have for this culture and community made it very clear where I should be with my family. I'm beyond excited to help this team and the university in any way needed. 
I'm also excited for my kids to see the work never stops, fail harder, end quote. So with this, Virginia has been in a bit of a downward spiral since that 2019 championship that Kyle Guy was a critical part of. Uh, Keyhead Clark just now is finally gone, (laughs) Uh, was a freshman on that team. And Virginia has basically forgotten how to score. And Kyle Guy, along with Ty Jerome and Kihei Clark and others on that team, you know, knew how to operate in a Tony Bennett system, but still be very efficient offensively within that. And I'm very hope, you know, I know he's not. Yes, we've gone from three to five uh, assistant coaches now. He's not one of those. So he's not going to be able to impact on court during games at the same level, but the things he can do just being around the program and being part of it um, is going to be massively, in my opinion, helpful for the current Cavs to, to get up to the level that we're expected or or, um, used to seeing from Tony Bennett's Cavaliers. So I I'm excited about this and really interested to see what kind of impact it has on Virginia and their culture. And honestly, I think Kyle Guy one day could be a great head coach. And so, man, if this is a first step into that, really interested to to follow that career path. All right, gang, that's it for today's episode of Locked On College Basketball. Thanks so much for joining. If you haven't subscribed to the show, please do that on audio and video. If you are not part of the Locked On College Basketball Discord, we'd love to have you. The link is free. It's in the show notes. Come on, join us. It's a blast talking college basketball all the time. As always, want to apologize to the lawyer family. Say, let's go Wildcats. I guess today that's the Villanova Wildcats. And until tomorrow when Andy and I wrap up the week. Peace.